Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining and for giving your time to discuss Ultima Security Guidebook and how this will assist you in developing a future-proof security strategy. So just before we start and as a quick introduction, I'm Mark Orange, Solutions Security Architect here at Ultima, where we have a great capability across our professional services and managed services teams. We operate mythologies like Security Built-in, Zero Trust and Secure by Design, and as such, each one of our consultants who specialise and focus on specific technologies across the data centre, the cloud and workspace, provide security guidance in that specialisation, which is incorporated into the planning, the design, implementation and advisory services, all of which align to the vendors and NCSC best practice. As security architect, I support that wealth of detailed knowledge with a wider security view, industry trends, best practices, compliance and strategy as we're doing today as well as implementation of some of the security specific solutions. In context of the current climate, which has presented many challenges for many organisations when providing continuity of service, connectivity and collaboration for remote working, the security risks may have also increased. And we're seeing that threat actors are taking the opportunity to target users who may be more susceptible when working remotely and assert at new targeted campaigns. We've also seen in general terms, over time, the capabilities of threat actors continue to grow their methods continue to evolve, and with that, all organisations must continue to develop their security solutions. So with most now required to work remotely, and as we find a new normal way of working, with the likelihood that remote working will continue in some form, the changing in working patterns brings a change in traffic profiles, changing perimeters, and changing in the way that security must be applied. OK, so a snapshot of the agenda today. I'll start with a brief review of the current security trends and an overview of the changing controls and requirements to provide security in today's remote working practices. Then moving on to a summary of the recently published guidebook and how the solutions and the technologies within the guidebook will assist you in ensuring an effective security portfolio and protection of the three main areas, the users, the devices and the data. We have a wide audience today, and without making assumptions, it's likely that you have existing solutions for some of these areas, but please view this as a chance to recap on the market movements, the trends, or any new areas where your existing solutions or portfolio may need building upon in order to complete your security roadmap and future strategy. Then finally, wrapping up with a short list of the strategic service offerings available from Ultima, and what we can do to help you develop or align your strategy to what we see in the marketplace and best practice guidelines. And to finish up, I'll pass on some information on how you can get in contact with us for further details on anything I've spoken about today. So before we get into the security guidebook, I'd like to take a moment to step back and understand what we're aiming to achieve with the security solutions and services we offer. Often solutions are implemented just because it's the way things are done, or because compliance requirements have stated it's needed but I personally believe in a holistic view of security across all areas and consistent maintenance of those solutions to ensure that they're not only focused and capable of protecting the organisation against the threats that we're faced with today, but also that those that we forecast going forwards. Ultima have strategic partnerships with the leading security vendors and our friends at Checkpoint have recently released some interesting statistics showing a spike in specifically related to the COVID-19 pandemic, as I mentioned earlier. In just a three-week period, they reported that there are almost 20,000 new coronavirus-related domains registered around the world, and that 17% of those had been identified as malicious or suspicious. And during just a single week, 192,000 coronavirus-related attacks were seen. Generally, though, throughout 2019, the economy within what we know as the dark web continued growing at pace and was recently reported so by Forbes. Threat actors are continuing to look for weak areas to target, and as organisations move to close gaps and increase security in those key areas, the threat actors start looking for other areas. In 2019 saw a move to attacks based on mobile technologies and reported a 50% increase in mobile banking malware, which had the aim of stealing credentials from that device, and a 27% of organisations who reported a malware incident within this period identified some sort of involvement from a mobile device. Furthermore, we still continue to see threats in the cloud technologies. As valuable data is moved to the platforms which are more accessible and more available, misconfiguration of these resources is still quite common. 
However, to combat this trend, many vendors and platform providers have given security dashboards to highlight where secure configuration has not been applied in accordance with their best practice. But fundamentally, the dark web economy is continuing to grow by detecting weaknesses and then targeting attacks towards these weaknesses in order to make financial gain, either from selling on valuable data or for holding that data for ransom. And this is why it's so important to be proactive in the management of your organization's security posture. We need to be able to identify where these weak areas are, perform regular reviews and align the applied controls accordingly, not only to provide detection, but to provide protection to stop these threats before they become attacks and to isolate in real time those attacks, not if, but when they happen. So as I lead into our security guidebook, this is a quick snapshot of all the areas which we suggest should be included and maintained in order to have that holistic 360 degree view of secure IT in alignment with NCSE cyber essentials and regulatory requirements. But security is not easy and there is not one thing that can solve the security requirement. The enterprise must maintain security in many areas. However, a malicious actor only needs to find the one insecure area and as new technologies come to market which are often focused on productivity or connectivity first new security surface areas and controls must be defined ultima can provide advice and solutions in all of these areas but for this session we'll focus on the three high level topics of protecting the user protecting the device and protecting the data of course all within the context of the current climate and the increased remote working. So why is remote security different? Well, there are many ways of achieving secure remote connectivity, from VPN into a corporate infrastructure, all the way to authenticated access into cloud services. But the key is to ensure that the service is configured securely to provide access only to the resources required and that the service is monitored to ensure that it's being used in the correct manner. But as we now move into a period where conditions and working arrangements within the organisations have stabilised, we get the opportunity to take a look with a fresh view. And it's expected that these new ways of working will continue at least into the medium term and that we'll find ourselves into a new normal. Having moved past the immediate requirement of focusing on maintaining service and connectivity we should be reminded that security may have been a lower consideration and that threat actors are also aware of this and have been seen to use this opportunity as temporary configuration may have had weakness and changing of working patterns may mean gaps in security monitoring or users working away from the office who have had less direct protection or awareness of how to maintain security practices when outside of the office. But many companies have had to increase their remote working platforms some hastily expanding existing solutions and some fast tracking in new solutions. But what we have seen is that many of these configurations are expedited to facilitate connectivity in what was an unplanned and unexpected scenario. These configurations may have been done with the view of being temporary in order to overcome the short term requirements or to provide basic functionality as a platform to build upon. In either case, we are now moving into a second phase and moving from the expedited temporary solutions and evolving into a more permanent, supported, resilient and secure platform to support what is becoming the new normal way of working. In this new normal, we have a number of clients who have not been used to remote working and organisations that had previously seen the risk of remote working as a lower priority and had only applied such controls to a small proportion of their estate now find these growing exponentially. Until recently, Regular use of VPN had typically been required only by a small subset of clients who were well trained and well versed in how to protect their services when working outside of the office. But today we suddenly have a lot of clients and a lot of data existing outside where clients may not be as confident or as well versed with the risks and the procedures appropriate to maintaining their security when remote. A simple change of working practices and working patterns or locations could have a significant impact even to some of the basic practices followed by many clients such as are they aware of how to change their password if working remotely and connected to a predominantly on-premises infrastructure via a VPN 
or do they still get prompted to change their password when it expires? Are they aware that they may not have had the protection of the enterprise perimeter and will need to be more diligent? And are they aware that access to online services may not have had the same level of inspection applied? Whilst most users will have had a basic understanding when accessing non-work related sites from a corporate computer and not clicking on unknown links, it's also now more likely to occur. We have inevitably had to have to use services which we have not previously used and not be aware if these are legitimate resources which we're being directed to, as well as many have also been supporting children with remote schooling and a multitude of other different practices. Control of which online services are trusted and which are malicious is often applied at the perimeter gateway or internet proxy, and clients become used to this. They're able to spot the obviously malicious sites, but these sites are becoming more and more difficult to spot manually. However, without the ability to control internet access at the endpoint, this is effectively what we're asking many users to be able to do. We've also seen a fundamental change in the normal traffic profiles. Typically, we manage two types of traffic at the perimeter, egress and ingress. Egress, in the majority of environments, is predominantly made up of web traffic. Browsing to public internet services or cloud platforms and SaaS applications like Office 365 but with the move to remote working, this traffic has almost instantly disappeared to be now only a small proportion of traffic seen at the premise and connections exiting from the client directly over their local home network. Ingress, the other type, is access to services and applications hosted within the data center via the perimeter and services such as VPN or legacy published applications. These will have previously had a smaller percentage of traffic, but now have the highest. They may have had minimal concern and visibility before, but now are operating critical services and possibly stretch beyond their original design. The question is, are the security configurations still appropriate in these new use cases? And it may be time for a fresh look. Our checklist hopefully give you some pointers. Moving on to the focus areas now. Protecting your users is crucial to maintaining the security of a company's environment. Users are often the most targeted by malicious actors who often try to coerce or deceive with very well-crafted and convincing methods. Threat actors often target campaigns at users to collect credentials which will allow access onto cloud resources, remote access services, or for use on existing exploits, perhaps just to download hidden malware which will provide an entry point for further malware installations and to traverse the internal network. These risks increase with remote working, as policies and logs are spread across many locations, and therefore adapting your security procedures to ensure your users are protected no matter where they are, and no matter where they're working from, is critical. Multi-factor authentication is probably the most important measure in protecting your users' credentials and stopping them from being used adversely. The latest generation of multi-factor authentication service offers intuitive interaction with users by means of multiple authentication options, which include text messages, voice calls, push notifications and passwordless authentication, making it very easy to use. Our preferred solution from Microsoft also natively integrates with cloud platforms and legacy systems and should be applied across the estate to authenticate internal applications as well as those with external presence to provide that additional layer of protection against inside threats and east-west traversal. But to avoid MFA fatigue, integration with conditional access is also extremely useful. It provides reduced checks when in a trusted state and only increased prompts when in a new or untrusted state is seen. Conditional access also learns normal usage patterns and then further reduces any unnecessary prompts. Secure internet access services provide the essential control needed to stop a user inadvertently or accidentally accessing malicious locations and downloading malicious content. When users were in the office, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it was often the perimeter gateway or internet proxy that provided this control and the reporting of internet activity. These controls are as important when working away from the office and possibly even more so as employees are more likely to access non-work related content as well. But traditionally, the solution was simple to enforce a VPN back to the data center where these controls could be applied. But with the use of modern SaaS based applications, 
This is often results in a negative experience and the VPN is disconnected or split tunneling is enabled or the employee simply finds a way to work outside of these controls. In either case, access to the internet could become unfiltered and the risk of accessing malicious content is increased. Ultima recommend using a cloud-based solution where user's internet access can be secured with your policy wherever they are, inside or outside of the office, and without experiencing any loss of performance or any difference in service. Our recommended solutions provide all the capabilities you'd expect, including category-based URL filtering, centralised policy and logging, but also provide additional ability in being able to react quicker to unknown threats and benefiting from the scale of a global SaaS-based platform. And having geolocated POPs provide service local to the user, no matter where they are, with high-speed inter-cloud connections and high-capacity compute platforms in order to provide quick evaluation of zero-day threats. These global SaaS platforms are already in use by many large organisations and provide a large percentage of the current internet traffic. What this means is that the platform will categorise any new content for the first time it's requested, whether that was good or bad, and it's highly likely the system will have already seen a threat and classified the destination, which gives all the users of the platform much better performance and security. In addition, these platforms are designed for use by any type of device, across Windows, Mac and mobile, and ensures a consistent approach, no matter what the device the employee uses, who will often have multiple devices, from a laptop, a mobile phone and a tablet, all with access to corporate applications and credentials. But there will remain a requirement to access on-premise applications, and this may be for many differing reasons. In the same light as providing security for access to internet-based services across all devices, it's also important to provide secure access to on-premise application services across all devices, which may be via a VPN, a VDI or a published application. Each method has its pros and cons, and some applications will work better or be more suited in each case, but VPN continues to be the most heavily used remote access service. And the most common delivery method of VPN is either based on a consolidated perimeter gateway or a dedicated VPN solution, which could be hosted on-premise, cloud-hosted or a SaaS-based solution, and Microsoft always on VPN. But it's vital to make sure that these services can provide connectivity to all device types, validate trusted devices and integrate with PKI-based certificate and MFA solutions. Here at Ultima we have multiple solutions available from multiple vendors in this area. I'll be happy to discuss with you which ones are appropriate in your environment. Okay, so following on from providing the ability for a user to securely access the resources they need from any platform and any location, we also need the ability to manage those devices, which may be of multiple types and in any location. Again, previously it's likely that the majority of these devices will have been desktops located in an office, or laptops which rarely left the office, and this gave the ability to closely monitor them and easily protect them. But now the majority of devices being used are outside of the perimeter and possibly consist of mobile devices and personal devices and maintaining the security of these devices may require a different approach. We need to be able to ensure the anti-malware solution continues operating, receiving updates and sending logs. To maintain the deployment of security patches to the operating system and numerous applications and to continue the ability to update these applications to the latest version or just to deploy new applications and to manage the security policies of the device and make sure we can deploy changes to these policies when needed, but also to collect the logging and monitoring data, which is essential for gaining insights into threats, maintaining compliance and providing data for a forensic analysis when needed. The key to maintaining these capabilities is hosting on a cloud-based or internet-facing platform that can provide service to the device no matter where it's located and allow continuous connectivity to and from that device without relying on a VPN for connectivity. However, secure connectivity to and from the perimeter is still required and this is one area that's typically mature, but as we discussed earlier, the traffic profile may have significantly changed and the controls applied at the perimeter may need to be reassessed. We also see emergence of new perimeters that get overlooked 
for instance, the point of ingress and egress at your cloud tenant, do IaaS services hosted in these locations have the same level of controls applied? And do they include IPS, URL, and malware control? We often come across misunderstanding of the shared security model, which is used by all cloud providers. They will ensure the security of their cloud platform, but it remains your responsibility to maintain the security of your IaaS services and the configuration of your tenants. Misconfiguration of cloud services or reduced security capability at these perimeters continue to be commonly exploited and frequently newsworthy events are being reported. So should a device become compromised, lost, stolen, or just be found in the wrong hands while you weren't looking, encrypting the device provides a last line of defense. The risk is even more prevalent with the increased number of devices being used outside of the office at the moment, and them not necessarily always being kept in the most secure of locations when they're not in use. Encrypting the device won't necessarily protect the data or the device while it's switched on, but it will stop anyone regaining access when it's switched back on. For an adversary to achieve full control of a mobile device and attempt to bypass the lock authentication, it may be put into a development mode or rooted, and this process is highly likely to fail if the encryption credentials are not available. Likewise, any data on the phone cannot be accessed or removed, allowing the mobile device management platform to perform a remote wipe and remove that threat. We often recommend native encryption abilities from Microsoft or Apple, which both offer enterprise-grade encryption at rest, but it's key to ensure that it's centrally managed, and the Microsoft BitLocker integrates tightly with Microsoft Security Stack and other cloud services as well, including BitLockers to go for securing USB media. Now on to the final piece of the puzzle, protecting the data. This is often where an adversary is trying to get to with the user and the device providing the method of getting here. This is where the value is and where we need to make sure this valuable data is adequately protected. And the value may be seen in terms of financial resale of intellectual property to competitors or credentials and personal data to the market or just for disruption and brand reputation. So in similar trends as we already discussed, as the users and the devices have moved away from the office and the managed perimeter, so has the data. Moving into externally managed data centers, cloud hosted environments, SaaS platforms, file sharing and collaboration platforms, data now exists in many different places and in many different contexts. But keeping control of this data can be a challenge. So we must ensure that we protect the data itself rather than solely rely upon the services around it and preventing access into it. And backing up this data continues to be critical in being able to secure it and recover it if and when needed. However, in a dispersed set of solutions, often very difficult to do so. Tools such as Avpoint and Veeam give the ability to back up data across many different platforms, including on-premise data centers, cloud platforms, and SaaS solutions such as Office 365. However, knowing where the data is stored and controlling where that data is stored is as important. OneDrive provides a great place to hold data for access when in the office, when outside of the office, for use across multiple devices and applications and have the ability to back it up. Archiving of data can also be helpful, especially in email platforms. Once or if credentials are obtained by an adversary or malicious insider, mailboxes are an easy target and often contain a lot of sensitive information as email continues to be the platform commonly used for sharing of information and documents both with internal colleagues and external customers, suppliers and partners. Adversaries can make use of a mailbox for sending impersonating emails, but also will have a look at its contents. An archiving of data when it's no longer required to be held online minimises the amount of data that may be available in this case. Tools natively within Office 365 will allow you to have this capability and may already be included within your existing licence. Alternatively, Vendors such as Mimecast can provide the same capability and both also provide protection, which we now almost take for granted in protecting malicious email content and spam email from coming into the environment and additionally nullifying embedded links and images to assist with preventing anyone accidentally clicking on that bad link. But having a policy that automatically defines the security applied to a file helps. Being able to use clear tags and labels to help users define internal documents, confidential documents 
or public documents also allows the platforms and the technologies behind this to manage where that document is saved, who can open it and what can be done with it when it's open. Microsoft Azure Information Protection can protect the document from end to end. So if a document which is marked as internal use only gets shared externally, the end recipient would not be able to access this document. And by adding on Azure Rights Management, we can go even further with encryption and tracking and other features. With RMS, you can protect a file and the protection will stay with that file, even if it's saved or copied to a storage location that's not under the control of an organization, such as a home PC. And furthermore, you can then audit and monitor the usage of these protected files, prevent them from being printed, text copied, or an email being forwarded even after the data has left the company's boundaries. And this is where a secure file sharing platform adds not only functionality and usability, but also security. Sharing of files and data via email is not recommended, and SMTP is not a secure protocol as I mentioned. Email accounts are often a target. Public file sharing sites are not the place either, but they're often growing in use because they provide the access and the functionality that clients need, especially when working remotely and separated from their colleagues and their customers. But collaboration platforms such as Microsoft Teams, SharePoint and OneDrive do provide the secure and the flexible solution to support functionality and the ability to securely access data by clients internal to your organization and external parties where enabled. Azure Active Directory allows external partners who may not have an Azure AD in place to use your organization's applications and access data whilst keeping compliant with your company policy. And a combination of Azure Rights Management and Azure AD, there's no need to explicitly configure trust with other organizations before you can share protected content with them. Also for Citrix customers, similar features can be enabled with Citrix ShareFile. This enables you to share all required files and documents with a simple few clicks. ShareFile also includes features with limitless storage and an email plugin for ease of use with bank level encryption and capabilities to protect data both in transit and at rest. So I hope that was useful and possibly highlighted some areas where further consideration may be needed or even just provoke some thoughts and some conversation. Security isn't talked about enough, nor is always understood by people outside of the security team. So to summarise the takeaways from today's session, here's a checklist of items to run through and reference within your own security roadmap and your own security strategy. Please make sure that you have a strong MFA solution in place and it's applied across the user estate, internal and cloud applications. Please make sure that you have a process of identifying your employees when they make requests for assistance and password changes are made. Please make sure that you continue to have the ability to manage, maintain and update devices inside and outside of the office and that you have the policies in place to manage the data around the organisation. Please also make sure that in these times of heightened risk that your employees continue to be educated about the threats and the behaviours that they should follow when working in these differing patterns and that you have the ability to monitor the platforms for unusual and malicious activity and that your configurations are in line with the NCSE guidelines and regularly tested not only to identify issues but to close any areas of weakness before they are discovered by the threat actors. Now I've mentioned a few times already, monitoring the use of the systems is as important as providing the security protections for them. We must expect that a security vulnerability will be found and exploited at some point and have the ability to know when that has happened and mitigate it before it escalates. Running a fully featured security operation centre is a complex and time consuming activity. With SIEM at the heart, collecting data from all areas, analysts must pivot this data, hunt out threats identify anomalies and find where a compromise may have happened and what was impacted and how to remediate it. The ultimate MDR solution can help with all of these and more and often in a more cost effective and sustainable manner. Our guidebook contains the data sheet and some of the other benefits which you may be able to realise whilst unlocking your internal teams from time consuming activities and enabling them to focus on driving more business value.
In today's session, I've covered a wide area and aligning your security portfolio, roadmap and strategy in all of these areas can be a challenge. Maintaining alignment to the NCSE guidelines and with the evolving marketplace and the emerging threats is another area that organisations can find themselves struggling. And finding time whilst also managing a busy operation is sometimes very difficult or you may just benefit from an independent viewpoint, guidance and some advice. Our security assessment comes in three packages designed to give you the flexibility and the level of depth appropriate to your requirements and all with a risk-based graphical report to highlight any areas of recommendation. From a light touch questionnaire based assessment and discussion through to a workshop with automated analysis of configuration, vulnerability testing and management of a remediation plan including regular risk update sessions all packaged into an ongoing service plan our cyber security assessment can be a valuable asset when building your strategy. And underpinning our operational services and managed services, we have a service desk and technical support service for all the technologies discussed here today. The data sheets included in our guidebook for reference and will give you the assurance of technical support where and when it's needed. So as we bring this session to a close, I'd like to thank you for your time today. I hope you found this useful. And here is a snapshot of our main vendors and solutions, which provide the monitoring and the protection across all of the areas of private and public cloud data centers and SaaS services, endpoint and mobile security, and some of the components which you'll have seen in more depth during this session, including secure internet services, SIEM, security monitoring, which is so crucial for an organization of any size. And I'll leave you with a quick summary of the areas in which we can help you increase your security capabilities, or just to review, check and give advice. I won't hold any questions live on this webinar today due to the large number of attendees, but you can download a copy of this guidebook from the Ultima website and forward any questions which may have come up during this session to your dedicated account team or to inquiries at ultima.com who are standing by ready to respond and include any inquiries for further information on any of the solutions that you have seen in this webinar or just general information around our professional services, managed services and advisory services. So with that, thank you for joining today. I hope to speak to you again shortly.